reading today is from Ephesians chapter 5, 1 through 21. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. If fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather give thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who are asleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Amen. Yes. Father, we give you thanks for your word which not only is a map for our lives, but it, 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 brings, it brings light, it brings wisdom, but most of all, it brings love. So we thank you for that, Father, and we look forward to this word that comes forth from your servant this day in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Got a lot of toys around here. Lord, let me not knock anything over before the day is up, I ask. I'm going to share, um, well, first let me tell you, my name is Mike LeClaire. I'm the pastor of Living Hope Church. I'm blessed to see you here. Um, there's a lot of things going on. And uh, things bring about other things, haven't you noticed? Stuff brings about other stuff. Mud brings about mud. But the love of God brings about peace. And that's kind of the word I felt that we heard this morning. What I'd like to do is bring some clarity to some things uh, as I see it, and um, just so there's no misunderstandings. Do you, do you know what we're about here in this church, just sitting where you're at, and I just want you to think, not answer, but do you know what we're about here in this church? We're about reaching out to people, people that aren't in here. The people are, who are in here are about reaching out to those who are not here. And that's just a foundational thing. The other thing is we're about presenting the word of God as the spirit leads us. We're about presenting truth, the truth of God's word. And I'm just going to share, I'm just going to read this to you just to make some clarity on some language because language has been affected just like everything else has been affected in this word. And the first word I want to talk to you about is community. In the course of time, and oftentimes, the meanings of words can change. I remember several years ago, the word community, which is a wonderful word, somehow took on a different meaning than what it used to be, especially within the church. It used to mean a group or gathering of people coming together under a common purpose. So in the church, it was getting together to grow in the understanding of God and his word. Over time, it became a term that carried the idea of compromise, that we would somehow make it about the society's acceptance of every thought and every belief over God's word. In our church, 
community, common unity, is that we come to understand the fullness and the truth of who God is by his word without compromise. So you're going to see things, and you're going to see people of different kinds coming in here and know that the objective is for them to come in here. That we can share the love of Christ with them and preach the truth to them as God leads us. I've got another word for you. And the word is relevant. In the church, this church, we preach God's word and the truth of it, and we do our best to bring about the understanding of God's word, which is totally relevant to our lives. God's word is relevant. Also, the word gives us understanding to point out the relevance of that word to our lives. We cannot conform the word to our understanding, but we must conform our understanding to the truth of God's word. There is nothing more rev- relevant to man than God's word. Though many scoff at it, you can't deny its relevance. What society has done with the word relevant is they've taken it and personalized it for self, that everything has to be about self, and if it's not relevant to pleasing my flesh, myself, what I want, then it's not relevant. And I'm here to tell you that the word of God is the most relevant thing that you will ever come across because in it is life. Got one more word for you. This term is called diversity. Did you ever hear it? This word, I'm going to speak from a church's perspective. This word speaks to the different giftings from God to his people according to his word. There's once again no compromise of God's word here. God is the focus and the giver of the different gifts. We are to celebrate the different giftings that line up with Scripture. We here at Living Hope invite all who seek truth, all who seek truth, regardless of their racial, physical, economic, political, or intellectual differences. We seek to reach those who are lost to give them the truth of who God is in our community. And there are people of different and all different kinds of groups that I mentioned And we're to teach and reach them with the truth and love of Christ. Diversity. I'm bringing this up because there's just, people get upset over the words because what they've done is they've taken the words that society has now converted to their liking. We grab onto that word and we lose the real meaning of what the word is meant to be. Diversity is a beautiful word. And frankly, as a church, we haven't been so great at it. If I talk political diversity, if you vote differently than some people, you're excommunicated from the church, quietly, spiritually, not physically thrown out. When did that ever come about? And believe me, I have strong political leanings. I tend to be conservative in it. But there's people who just think differently than me. That's okay. If it violates the truth of God's word, then we have something to talk about. And it's not to put one down, it's to teach and to educate. That's why we're here. 1 Corinthians 12, 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God who walks all in all. We just heard of the whole Trinity right there at work in diversity of works and ministries. And in spirit. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues. We are here in diversity all over the place here. This is a beautiful thing. If we weren't, we look like a church that everybody thought and looked exactly the same. I don't want to go to that church. What if they're wrong? And we're all like them. No, no, God doesn't work that way. He gives gifts to men. He tells us to desire all his gifts. Desire all the gifts. But some he just gives special strength in a particular gift. Moses said, I wish all in the camp would prophesy. I wish all people would prophesy. 
in the church sometimes, the prophet thinks they're higher than the apostle, or the apostle thinks he's higher than the teacher, and the teacher's higher than the preacher. What's wrong with us? God gave the gifts. God's the giver of the gifts. Thank you, Jesus, for the gifts. Be thanking him for the gifts. Don't criticize who he's given what gift to. And by the way, look at the gifts that he's given you and give thanks. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks. You want to talk about division? Look at Jews and Greeks. Whether slaves or free, and have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If this were not so, we Gentiles would be up the proverbial crick without a paddle. We would not be grafted into the faith. We would not be called the bride of Christ. We would finally miss out on the different giftings that seem to come from different people groups. I want to say that again. It appears on many levels that there's diff different giftings that come from different people groups. I'm going to speak very briefly to one of the best services I've ever been to. It was a funeral. It was a funeral of Greg, Gregory Fisher. And at the funeral, worship was happening, and worship came to a different, it went to a different place. And Mike Fisher, Gregory's dad, got up, and he faces the crowd as they're worshiping, and it exploded in some of the purest, most heartfelt worship I've ever experienced. How did that come about? One, the Spirit of God moved upon the people of God who he gifted differently than the gifting that I have. And it was beautiful. Do not let the language of this day pollute the language that God has given us that is so beautiful. Next week we'll talk about rainbows. You okay? All right. Thank you. That was the lesson before the lesson, just so we're all on the same page. God works. Ephesians 5, 1 through 21. If we go back last week and a couple of weeks, we spoke a lot about how God got the attention of Paul. And he began to take Paul on a journey from his flesh to the spirit. Do you remember that? That was what God was doing in Paul's life. As I read through the rest of Ephesians, what I began to see was God was using Paul to take the church on a journey from the physical realm to the spirit realm. That is so exciting to me. He's, he wants to take us, who is flesh and blood, who think worldly too much, are affected too much by the world, he wants to get us away from our flesh and take us to the spirit. True worshipers worship God in spirit and in truth. Our God is so amazing. And he wants to take you and me in that place. And if we don't understand the diversities that God works in, we miss some of this beautiful move that he's going to do. So we begin with 5.1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Be imitators of God. What does that mean? That means we're to mimic the patterns of God. What are the things that God did that we're to imitate? First is to love. He had a discourse with Peter about the word love to bring Peter to a place of understanding what love is. And Peter came up short. He came up short. He came up short. The best he could do is the love of a brother, friendship love, or the love of a child. God has taken us to a place in the spirit realm that we love like he loved, which is agape. So the title of the message is Why Because Therefore. Because he begins with the word therefore. Therefore be imitators of God. For him to use the word therefore means he has to go in the past. And many people will go in the past about five or six or seven verses. What I, what I want to do is I want to go in the past but I want to go back to the beginning of the chapter. Therefore, because of everything that was spoken from chapters one through five, 
everything that was spoken from one to five speaks to this therefore and brings us to the place of being imitators of God. In chapter one, starting at verse three, blessed us with every spiritual gift. Why do we therefore want to be imitators of God? Because he has blessed us with every spiritual gift. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ. Are you starting to get the idea how important chapter uh, one is? This is what God has done for us. This is why we are to become, and this is how we are to become imitators of God. In him we have redemption through his blood. In him is the forgiveness of sins. Made known to us, he made known to us the ministry or the mystery of his will. We've obtained inherent an inheritance. We are predestined. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We are guaranteed of our inheritance. Why do we imitate him? Because this is what he's done for us. This is what he's done for us, and we need to know that. And so what do we do? Therefore, what do we do with what we just read? We do not cease to give thanks. Are you a person who gives thanks? to God. Do you do it just before you go to bed? Do you do it just before you eat supper? Or do we live in an attitude of giving thanks? And I think that's what he's calling us to do is to be thankful for everything. Count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. I don't want to count it as joy. I don't like trials. No. Count it all joy. Why? Because God is doing something. And I say thank you for the trials. And personally, I say thank you for getting me out of them. Because it's hard. But he is at work. Thank you, Jesus. We move on. Why else should we be imitators of God? We go to chapter 2. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Why do we do what he wants? Because we were dead. Not in the flesh. We were spiritually dead. What does that mean? That means no eternity with God in heaven. That means no eternity with the brothers and sisters of Christ. We were dead. And he'll come back to that in chapter 5. But what did he do? You, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. How did we walk? We once walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. What did Paul just do? He just took a giant leap into the spirit realm. Who are we? We were people of the world. What does that mean? That means we were controlled by the spirits and the principalities and the powers of the air. We lied, we cheated, we stealed, we did the work of our father who is not in heaven. What did he do? He made us alive spiritually that we no longer walk in that. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And then in verse 13, it says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. There is no other way to come to Christ. You cannot be good enough. I cannot be good enough. I can't do enough things to come closer to Christ. I come closer to the, to the Christ because of what he has done and he shed his blood for my sin and it was a gift of God that he did it and I receive it fully. I receive the gift. If you receive the gift, you get the gift. Don't discount what he has done. Don't minimize what he has done on the cross by saying, that's not for me because I've been so bad. You heard Pastor James speak on that. Pastor James, he was very clear of the struggle and it's a struggle that many have. But he got it. He gets it. He's forgiven. He knows it per his testimony. That's the same for every one of us. Don't let the sin of your past, which, by the way, the enemy of your soul, here's what he does. He's whispering in your ear all the time, all the time. And it's so subtle. It's a whisper. You can't hear it, but it's going on all the time, and it's to to diminish what Christ has done in your life. And I'm here to tell you, you believe by faith what he's done in your life. Amen? Amen? Amen. 
You've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Therefore, now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but your fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household. Why? Because you believe this by faith. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your shed blood. We do communion to get to the place of sharing with one another together, community, if you will, about the shed blood of Christ and what it's done for us, and we remember it. Don't forget what God has done for you. Why else should we be imitators of God? Well, because chapter 3 says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me for you. He reveals the dispensation. What is the dispensation? That Christ came now for the church. We are the church. And this is the period we live in. It is the church age, the dispensation. And I would say it like this, from Judaism to the Gentile. He's never done with the Jew, but he's got to focus on the Gentile. That's you and me, the non-Jewish people. For what purpose? The purpose of being the bride of Christ. That's what the purpose is. That we would be united with him forever. And he's about that business. So much so that he takes his main man, Paul, through a journey from the flesh to the spirit. And now Paul has taken you and me on a journey from our flesh to the spirit in this book. Isn't that amazing? Just amazing. If you're sleeping, you're missing it. <laughs> Jesus. Why else? I've heard the disp- Okay. By revelation, he made known to me the mystery. What's the mystery? The mystery of Christ. He's made it known to us. To who? To the believer. How has he done this? By revelation, he made known the mystery. That you may understand knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which other, in other ages was not made known to the sons of man, and now have been revealed by who? By the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. What's he saying there? He's made known the truth of the dispensation in the, the, the move of the church age by his prophets and by his apostles. And who are they? They are the people that God has anointed to bring about the word of God that we read and study today. What a gift that he, by his Holy Spirit, spoke to these men of God and that they were able to scribe the word of God that we could read it today. Thank you, Jesus. Why, do we, why are we about the truth of God's word? Because God has ordained it. He's ordained it through his men that he has raised up. His men, who he has had interaction with for the purpose of you and me coming to know who Jesus is. Thank you. And then we are also, Gentiles, we're to be fellow heirs of the same body. So eventually we will be co-heirs with the Jews. Why? We're grafted in. Into what? Into the family of God. We're called spiritual Israel now. We're spiritually Jews. Jews who don't know Christ, who don't follow Christ, anything that they're supposed to follow are not spiritually Jews. They're nationally Jews, but they're not spiritually Jews. We're spiritual Jews. We've been grafted into the vine. At the end of this dispensation, God is coming back, and he's coming back primarily for the Jew. When's that going to happen? I don't know. I know the seasons. My personal belief is we're in that season. I don't know the day or the hour but I believe we're in the time. God's about ready to call his church home. One of the indicators is that it's global. Everything is global. The other indicator is where where people are. People are no longer on the fence like they used to be. It seems that people are either all in or they're out. I get people in my office all the time, and I can see how far off they are. They think they're there, but they're not there. They're not even close. They think their good works are taking them to a place. So I'm just seeing that separation become greater and greater and greater. However, he says in the last days, there will be a great harvest. Who's going to be a part of that? Well, the Spirit of God is going to be all about that. But he's going to use people. Get into the harvest field, people. And don't squawk when the harvest field comes to us. God's doing us a favor. And we grab on. That doesn't mean we compromise at all. That means we get a chance to preach the love of God and the truth of God. 
led by the Spirit of God. Because that's what a true believer is. He worships in spirit and in truth. Oh, Jesus, your precious word. We doing okay with time? Okay, good. Chapter 4. Therefore, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which, was, which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. That's what we're called to do. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He is talking to a church right here. He is talking to a church right here. And what he's saying is we need to come together in that common unity. The division has to stop. It has to stop. Your politics is not our faith. Politics may have essences or uh, have pieces of your faith in it, but in and of itself, it is not your faith. One side, the other, or the third, or the fourth parties. You have to know this word. I have to know this word. I have to know Christ. He is our faith. And he says for the church to come together in this unity and do not let these other things separate you. Now, there could be 50% of you in here that when I start talking about, and we talked about this earlier, Pastor James did and so did I, about predestination and adoption and all those really hard, difficult things. We may be 50-50 on that in the church. It's okay. That's not a salvation issue for us. If I don't get that right, I'm, it's not a heaven or hell thing. But it is an opportunity for division, and I'm saying do not let it become an opportunity for division in the church. So you both groups go back and study it. Do that right after you vote. Voting's good. It's not the end of all things. I know this is hard to hear, especially when we're motivated and so driven to go to these different places. That's good. Be motivated and driven, but not divisive. That is a battle in itself. I wrestle with being divisive all the time. Thank you, Jesus, for what you do. In Ephesians 4, 17, it says, This I say, therefore, therefore, another therefore. There must be about a dozen of them in there. And testify in the Lord that you or I should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Okay. He's just taking it to another level. He's t teaching us how to walk in him. In the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Now, ignorance seems like a derogatory term. It just means that we don't know stuff. We don't know about this thing or that thing. We don't know about him, so we're, consequently, we're ignorant in that. If somebody says you're ignorant today, it's an offensive, an offensive shot. It hurts. And then they'll say you're an ignoramus, which takes it to the next level. It's personal, and that's how you took it. And it was personal. It was meant to hurt. But the word ignorant is not meant to hurt. You know what it's meant to do? It's meant to have light shined on it so that we come to the understanding. Why? Because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. They're blind. They don't understand. They don't see. It's our job to present it to them. Therefore, he gives us a long list here. Put, things that we're to put off. Things that we're not to do. He tells us very specifically so we're ignorant, ignorant, ignorant. <laughs> no longer. Put off concerning your former conduct, the old man. That's what we're supposed to do as believers. We get rid of the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Put away our lusts. Put away lying. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer. What are we talking about? We're talking about people who operated out of ignorance, and now he's shedding light by the word of God, Paul is, to not do these things anymore. Be ignorant on this no longer. Do this. Put the old man away because you're a new creature. Thank you, Jesus. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit of God is knocking on your heart's door, we heard a, a word given about God knocking on the door. 
Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by not, by acting in ignorance and not opening the door. You don't open the door because you don't know. What don't you know? You don't know the glory of God. You don't know the omniscience, the omnipresence of God. So you have to come to know him. So when he knocks at your door, what, what is he knocking at your door even mean? When you feel, and he's going to use feeling here, a physical thing. When you feel, and he'll transition it to a, a spiritual thing, when you feel in your heart that God is saying something to you, you feel a tug. You respond to it. Don't stifle it. Don't take the proverbial pillows on your ears and say, la, 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 I can't hear you, I can't hear you, la, la. No, no, no. And it's not always easy to hear. Who was it? Elijah? Was it Elijah that was with Samuel? I, got, I don't want to get this wrong. Thank you. I knew you'd be there for me. He hears a voice. He gets up. He thinks it's his master. No, 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 it's not. He goes back to sleep. He hears the voice again. He wakes up. What do you do next? Tell him your servant is listening. Amen. So for a young one who is going to be a prophet, to not get it right away speaks to the ignorance that we all operate in. And so what he's, what he's saying is, if you hear it, you hear the tug, respond to it. I would pray right now that everybody would have ears to hear and a heart to receive what God is saying to your spirit right now. I pray that for every one of us in Jesus' name. Okay, we're almost done with the first four chapters. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, right? Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all merit, merit, malice. And then he goes to the positive, and he says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. This is what we're supposed to do. What he's doing is de-ignifying, ignorifying, new word. <laughs> he's taking the ignorance out of us and he's giving us understanding and he's giving us wisdom. And basically he's saying, now walk in this. Chapter five. So we come back to, therefore be imitators of God. Why? Because of all these things that he has done for us, that he is teaching us, we are now at this point to become imitators of God. How do we imitate God? It's like I said at the beginning. We begin to love. That's a good place to begin. We begin to love. Who is able to love? Those who have been loved. Those who have been loved by him are able to love like him because of his spirit in us. How precious and how equipping he is to give us the, the tools to do what he's called us to do. Thank you, Jesus. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. We are to love like he loved. We are to love sacrificially. I'm going to go back to the divisions for a second sacrificial love means I'm going to love that person when they see it differently than I do. That's, that's a form of sacrificial love. I'm going to make it about them and not about me. Because if you're a believer in Christ and you are growing and thriving in your faith, it's no longer about you. You're his. You're sealed by his precious Holy Spirit. It's about them. It's about them. And what's it about? Them coming to know the one true God. What's it about for you? to tell them. What's it about me? To tell. In Jesus' name. And then he gives us another but. In verse 3, he says, but fornication and uncleanness and covetousness, let it not even be named among you as fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse joking, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. Why does he give us this list again? It says in verse 5, for this you know that no fornication Cater, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. If they don't come to Christ and get transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and they continue to live as worldly people, they do not enter the kingdom of God. They don't come in. Here's what it doesn't mean. 
If you're a saint, you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you slip up in one of these areas, you come to the feet of the cross and you ask Jesus to forgive you. Forgiveness should be happening every day. Every day. If you think of your own thought processes throughout the day, that should spend, you should be like, I don't even know who, you should be spending lots of time in prayer asking for forgiveness because we are constantly sinning. Oh, no, Pastor Mike, you don't know. I am holier than that. Then I would say to you, then be holy and sin not. But we're human, and we make mistakes. People coming through the door make mistakes. And God gives us grace where to give them grace, but we, we don't compromise the truth here. He says, be holy even as I am holy. But don't do these things because people whose lives are grounded in these things do not enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, Mike, but a loving God wouldn't send people to an eternal hell. You're thinking in the flesh. You're not thinking spiritually. That's not what his word says. His word is very clear. These people do not enter the kingdom of heaven. But God is love. Yes, he is. And every person that is sent to hell, he loves but a holy God is a holy God. And a loving God is a loving God. Which one is he more? Is he more love or is he more holy? He's both. He's holy both. Holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. He's holy, holy. He is holy, love. But he must do what he has to do. I don't know why Jesus wept the times he did. But I think in some cases he wept because he knew the realities of who people were going to follow and who were going to walk away into eternal death. And I think it breaks him. And he wept at the grave of Lazarus for all those that will not come out of the grave to eternal life, but they'll be cast into the sea. Oh, my. The business is serious business to share the faith with other people. We make it light or we've heard it so often in our whole Christian walk for the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years that, you know, I've heard that. But have we done it? It's a big deal that we get to the place where we do it. Thank you, Jesus. And then he says in verse six, and this is where I really get the picture of Paul taking us to the spiritual place. And he says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Who are the sons of disobedience? I thought it was my filthy buddies that talked dirty and did all this. That's not what he's talking about. He went back into the spirit realm. And the sons of disobedience are the principalities, the powers that are in the air, demonic, have nothing to do with them. Any faith that does not have Christ as the center and the way to the Father that does not believe in the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is of that spirit. Have nothing to do with it. I know there's people in here that have come from weird religions and faiths based on your testimony. And the beauty of stepping away from that because it is a spiritual battle. And when you have, have nothing to do with going back. And if you have no spirituality at all, do not go to that place and do not hang on to what you have, but come to know Christ. I'm just telling you like I see it. Actually, I'm telling you like the Spirit is revealing it to me through his word. Thank you, Jesus. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And when we get to Ephesians chapter 6, we'll put a real focus on that spirit. You guys getting hungry? All right. Ephesians 5, 7 begins with, Therefore, because of all these things, from chapter 1 to now, therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were once in that darkness, but now you are in the light. Walk as children of the light. Why? I go to CR about once a month now. And um, when I go there, the room is dark. The worship is beautiful. And the groups are impressive. And what I see happening in the groups is I see Jesus, the light of the world, coming in to the soul of man and begins to dredge up and reveal the things in man and in me 
as they share. Some of it's new stuff. It never came up before. And some of it is stuff that, that people are wrestling with. But what's the Holy Spirit doing? He is revealing by the Son, the light of the world, our sin. And it seems harsh to say, but it is the most beautiful thing. That's what the light of the world does. The light of the world exposes ourselves. It exposes our sin. It exposes everything that we talked about in this book so that we do it no more, that we warn from it because there's death linked to that and there's life linked to the truth of the light of the word. Amen. That was a bit wordy, but I think you get my point. We are children of the light and are no longer in darkness, so let us not walk and be in darkness. Let us be children of the light. Otherwise, look at what it says in Proverbs 26, 11. Don't be as a dog who returns to his own vomit. So a fool repeats his folly. Those are strong words. Don't go back. Keep dredging forward. And if you slip back, keep pressing forward in faith. And I pray for every one of us that the light of God's truth be revealed deep within us to help us get through this process of, really, it's sanctification. Thank you. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And that's what the light does. And he's got us back in the spirit realm. When you speak of the light and you speak of darkness, we're talking in the spirit realm. The realm that is more real than this realm that we're in right here. It's where it all happens. John 1.4 says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, did not overcome it, could not handle it. That's the light of Christ. And we always think about that in terms of other people, but this is for us. Look inward and let God reveal what we have to take care of and what we have to deal with. Verse 14, therefore, he says, this is for all of us. Oh, you guys aren't going to be able to eat today. Therefore, he says, awake, awake. What is he saying? You are dead if you don't awaken to this truth that you're hearing today. Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light, revelation, understanding, exposure to that which is out of order. See then that you walk circumspectly. That's a great word. Five of us in this room know what it means. Within the confines of or circling of holiness, if you think of it in those terms. Walk circumspectly, walk in holiness. In Peter, it says, be holy, be holy. We all know that scripture, now we have to be holy. And we can't do that in our own strength. And then here's another indication that he's gonna take it to the spirit realm. In Psalm 119, 105, he says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. He brings up the idea of light and he goes right into do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine. How did that get in there? Why is that such a big deal? Do not be drunk with wine. In which is dissipation. That means something that leads to debauchery, sensual pleasures. And then he says, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that they call alcohol spirits. Do not be seduced, if you will, by the Spirit, small s. But instead, it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? The Holy Spirit is linked to the light. How do I separate Jesus from the Holy Spirit from the Father? I, I can't. Same essence. Sometimes different functions. Sally gave me that the other day. We shouldn't be trying to separate it. What we should be separating is the capital spirit from the small s spirit. One that leads to deception. I'm going to tell you right now how that deception works. I was the toughest person around when I was drinking the spirits. Small s. I'd pick a fight with anybody. I talk smart. I was ignorant. That spirit is a deception. And no good thing comes from it. And it's the most unpopular thing to talk about, especially in a community that so loves the idea of it. But it's a deception. 
He says, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. Step out of darkness, step out of ignorance, and step into the light of this truth. This is not meant to condemn anybody. This is meant to bring truth to everybody here. Hear this truth, because in it is life. But be filled with the Spirit on a second level. The Spirit in us leads us, guides us, speaks to us, comforts us. But he's also speaking at the spirit realm. Be filled with the spirit that operates in the spirit realm. Why? Because it is in the spirit realm that the evil, I'm just going to get a little hyper-spiritual on you for a second, speaks into your ear and tells you what a loser you are. Speaks into your ear and says, you're not really forgiven. Yeah, others are forgiven, but what you did, no, you're not forgiven. No, hey, remember when you did that thing? Hey, do you remember when you slipped up and you messed up here? Yeah, just go with it. Just have, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. That is spiritual and that is evil. But when you are filled with the spirit of God, you see it because the light exposes it and it has no impact on you. Why? Because you're filled with the spirit of God. Paul has now taken you and I into the spirit realm and how we operate and how we live. You know what he's preparing us for? He's preparing us for eternity. The Bible says flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. We are spirit beings, and it is our spirits that never die. He says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, but what in the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? It is our spirit. When we are in him, our spirit is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in our spirit. Oh, my goodness, it's rich, it's deep. And he's taken us there just because... I think because God took them there. For out of the abundance of the heart, the seat where the spirit is, the mouth speaks. What does it or should it, the mouth speak? It should speak this. Last therefore. And this is, for all, this is all for all of us, but this is for all of us. And Joel, if you're gonna, do, are you coming up at all with your team? In Ephesians 5.20, it says, giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Do you fear God? We're to be giving thanks always. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how I pray. That's how I was taught to pray. I come to you in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, help me through this miserable life that I'm existing in. Help me. Give me what I need. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. What did I do? I just, I addressed the Trinity in my prayer and I dealt with my ignorance and I gave it to him. Help me in it. What we're going to do is we're just going to close off. Joe is going to close us off in song and then he'll close us with a prayer. But as you're sitting there, you can enter into the singing, but I want you to think about where you stand. Where, what is your spiritual condition concerning Christ? Are you all in? Or are you apart? You have an idea of God. You know who he is by name, but you have no power going on. The Bible says that puts you on the left with the goats. The sheep know his name, and they know who he is. They know that I belong to him and he belongs to me. So as you're sitting there, process that thought. And all you have to do to become a sheep, if you will, is say, Jesus, come in. I want you to be Lord of my life. Come. Come to me. I want all of you. Anything I can handle, you give it to me. I want everything from you and I want to walk away from that dark side.